Looking back over the last decade, it blows my mind to think about the amazing places I've had the chance to visit and fish. By making fishing a part of my work, along with a super supportive family, it really has given me the opportunity to wet a line in the most incredible places right across Europe. Then bang, a year of restrictions and lockdowns literally put a stop to all the travel and fishing adventures. However, when one door closes, another one opens, and suddenly, in the most unlikely of circumstances, I had found the opportunity to do something that I actually craved dearly. That drive to a venue, the approach or the walk up to the lake, that's some of the most exciting parts of a session for me. Retracing my steps, somewhere I can return to time and time again, building up the knowledge session by session, watching it change over the seasons, somewhere that feels like home. So in a year when the world was turned upside down, I went and joined the Syndicate Lake, a tranquil sliver of English carp fishing, which would become my happy place until the world would return to normality and I'd be off travelling once more. This is the story of that time. Yeah, for sure there'll be syndicate lakes around the country, but not like this. Not somewhere that hasn't been touched at all since the day it was created. Since the first seeds set from the trees and grew, they haven't been touched. The cabbages, the lilies, all the other weed in the lake, it's never been managed. It's, it's not had blue dye added, you know, to knock it back. It's not had areas cleaned off you know because it's problematical for anglers this is a lake in its rawest form at some point in the future it could be a hundred years from now 200 years from now the silt will just carry on building up the trees will carry on encroaching and I'm somewhere part way through that lake's journey it could have been here for 50, 100 years and already it's starting to encroach in. Already many trees have fallen in and have been left. The sill is, is out of hand. It's so, so deep and so, so soft that 50 years from now, it'll be a different lake to what it is now. But the important thing is, it's not been touched. It's just been left. And with that, there is an immense amount of mystery to it with the the pinnacle of that mystery being what exactly is inside it. It was early June when I walked through the fields for the very first time heading towards the back lake. I arrived before dawn after an almost sleepless night purely through excitement. Taking just minimal gear, a mat, scopes, net, bread and a bucket of squid, the camera, a pair of polarized sunglasses, and most importantly, bundles of enthusiasm. I quietly crept around the lake looking for signs of carp, and it was half a dozen or so tree climbs later when I spotted around 15 fish in a shallow area of the lake. So I got a three pound sawn off ready with a size four claw and a bread bomb attached. They never really did take anything off the surface, just the odd snatch and grab but what this did achieve was the odd bit of flake fluttering down through the water. Their reaction to this was much better, and after squeezing some bits tighter and letting them fall to the bottom, it wasn't long before I had a few towels in the air and I was into my first car. And it was a good one. You know, it had a bit of width to it. It was a beautiful black common. It went 27 pound two. Um, it was a real distinct common, but it was a beautiful fish. Really, really beautiful. I rang down immediately like a child, a gibbering mess down the phone to him, Dan, you're not gonna believe it. I've seen like 15 and I've only gone and hooked one and I've got it in the net. And yeah, it was just such a moment, man. It's giving me goose pimples now thinking about it. Having sort of been here the day before and had all that activity in the small pool, I decided to really focus my attentions there. And they were still there. Light was rapidly fading, um, whacked the sleep system up, chucked the barbecue on, got some rods in position, one at the bottom of the deep sort of hole in underneath the canopy on the gravel, uh, another rod position, and yeah, sort of settled in for the night. The first night and following morning was amazing. I'd had a couple of tench, one of which was over eight, a low double common, and also a much better upper 20 ghost deep, all from a real deep cleared off area of gravel under the dense overhanging tree canopy. 
I left on the morning of June the 15th though to head off elsewhere for the opening of the river season, but before leaving, did manage to stalk a lovely old mirror off the Bar Free line in Sweetcorn. It was a great start to my time at the lake and also the end of my solo visits, as from here on in, I was to be accompanied by Dan. My next session after that was the first one where Dan could finally come with me. Up until this point, I tried to do a little bit of filming, but I'm anything but an expert. And it was proving more than more of a hindrance and really restricting me from being able to do, you know, what I wanted to do. So yeah, I was buzzing Dan was coming to take a bit of responsibility and workload off me, but more so so he could see the place. I told him so much about it and yeah, just really wanted to walk him around it and show it to him. I can see one. <laughs> <laughs> First job was to really show Dan around, show him all the places that I'd spotted fish, I'd been baiting. Anyway, so I baited here and a couple of other spots. And this is where I hooked the big in the first time, here. Yeah, here, here, I'll show you exactly where. Yeah, so a little bit further than that. Yeah, probably about there, right? So I've got three bits of corn sitting on the bottom, like that boilie is now, and he's coming in this way. Yeah, like literally filling the whole void of water. But how deep do you think that is? Whilst doing that, I took a bucket of bait round with me and introduced it onto all my baited areas. A um, Couple of laps later, we stumbled across one of the particular spots, looking like, and I know this is cliche, a jacuzzi. It genuinely was fizzing and sheeting up everywhere. Looked at Dan, big smile on both of our faces, rubbed our hands together, went and got the gear. I always leave my barrow in the same spot, I've got a little parking space for it because I never know if I'm going to go left or right. In this instance, we came across the stream, got round and yeah, got into position. So that was two traps set. I did put a third rod out that night, this time in a solid bag. A couple of fish had flopped over, sort of out in the pads. And this was the first time in all the time I've been here that I was gonna cast further than this, you know, further than three, four meters out. Um, I haven't even explored out there with a marker float or a bare lead. But when you've got indications like that, when they're sort of flopping over, and one particular one was a nice mirror that just head and shouldered, I had to chuck a solid out there you know, and hope for the best kind of thing. It wasn't until a good few hours into darkness that I received the first take on the solid bag rod. Um, to be fair, at the start, I thought it was a tench. I was a little bit underprepared that I hadn't even set a landing net up. Just been too busy chatting with Dan. We had a lovely barbecue, chilled out that evening. But yeah, I had to politely wake Dan from his slumber to come and assist me. And yeah, we got it in the net. Really, really nice mirror. Slipped it in a sack just for a couple of hours until first light came round. Another absolutely mega one, this place. Yeah, first one from out in the lake, so to speak. Everything up until now has been real close range, just fishing under the rod tip or just lowering it in somewhere. But last night, yeah, I was getting played by Breen, to be fair, and there was a few carp crashing out in the pads, so I had a decision to make, and decided to chuck a solid bag out in amongst them and I was rewarded with another really special one. It was one of those classic mornings. Um, it wasn't particularly epic, but it was really, really atmospheric. Um, there was the odd tench rolling, there was some bubbles coming up and stuff. And yeah, quite quickly, just as the light broke through, we got that carp out uh, and proceeded to, to get it up just to get a few pictures. But in the midst of all that, I've only kind of had a take. Dan. So I left Dan to look after the carp, ran to my rods and began to commence battle. However, things got a tad more awkward after that when midway through playing that fish, my second rod's also gone. Well, that was mental. Carnage, you couldn't have scripted it. But did manage to catch both of those fish. One was probably a scrape of 20 pound common and the other a little bit smaller, but it had a tint of sort of koi in it and it was a very, very beautiful fish. Wow, wow, wow. Mega early morning brace. 
potentially not been caught before. If they have, I'd say it's a very long time ago, which makes it even more special. Oh, I'm in love with this place. The rest of the day was very, very strange. Every time I've come here, I've always managed to find them. I managed to track something down and fish for it. But I spent the whole day searching. They just were not in the edge. The odd fish would flop out and crash and stuff in the pads, but there was nothing in the edge at all. And it wasn't until very late that day that I finally made a call and decided to fish back in the shallows again. I got the rods out into position, but the night passed really, really quietly. Got up at five, done some tench fishing, couldn't even get a bite on the float. It was like the lake had just switched off and everything had gone to ground. Just before leaving, I'd done one last lap, put a bit of bait in, and lo and behold, almost minutes before I was about to barrow back to the motor, I found a group of fish. Not a big group, but one of them did look like a better fish. Not wishing to disturb them, I quickly set up a naked choddy, flicked it out into position, but I was shattered. I'd done two nights, very little sleep, constantly walking around and searching and climbing trees and stuff. And it was cold, it was a big wind. I said to Dan, I'm just gonna lay my head down just for a split second. And uh, yeah, 10 minutes later, I've woke up to Dan going, Dad, you're in, you're in, you're in. And uh, yeah, rod bent round. Having seen that big one down there, I was in two minds whether I'd been lucky enough to hook that one. Sadly on this occasion I hadn't, but it was another lovely common and a fantastic way to end up my first session with Dan. I was having a lovely dream then. I was dreaming about all the different monster car that might live in here. <laughs> yeah, proper dozed off. Wow. Still asleep. Oh, was I snoring? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Certainly the smallest of a bunch, but I'm still really, really chuffed with it and I cannot wait to get back down here in a couple of weeks' time. Another mega one. When Tom and I were younger, we used to fish one particular venue that no one else fished. And we used to store stuff down there. It was also a long walk from the car and we would have a particular tree that would have our food in it. We would have other trees with our bait in it and we'd leave our keep nets down there and our unhooking mats. When I first came here and I walked around it, I thought, this place is geared up for exactly the same thing. And yeah, decided to dig a bunker, came down with a survival spade into the densest part of woodland and uh, set to, started digging and there was mud going everywhere and, and it's been a godsend, it really has, you know, when you're coming across with all your gear that you need for your actual fishing session, the last thing I want to be doing is bringing surplus or, or extra bait for pre-baiting and stuff, so at the end of each session I just pop to the bunker, get the bait I need for, for baiting up before I go and when my bait stocks are depleted, I'll just top up the bunker and stuff. Because I can, because no one else is gonna take it and I'm not affecting anyone else's angling because I can. And that is an incredible feeling. That was the first few weeks of my time there and I was loving it. Everything about the place was everything that I'd been pining for in my angling. I'd felt like a kid again. The lake had just been left to its own devices, the surroundings, the solitude, and of course the carp. It had been an amazing start to spring. And that brings us up to now. 
I've got the gear, it's on the barrow down there. You probably noticed with the disturbance in the background, the whole tranquility of the place has been ruined a little bit today. I say ruined. There is a farmer plowing his field. That's the noisiest I've ever heard it. As well as the noisy tractor, really making any more pieces to camera very difficult. I've got an even bigger problem on my hands and that is every time that's been going past, we've stopped filming and I've just been peering over the edge here. There's two fish down here feeding on a bit of flake. They've completely cleared me out. So I desperately need to go back, load up the bucket again, do one final lap, get a little bit more flake in and make a decision where I'm gonna spend the rest of the morning and the best part of the day fishing. Long and short of it, I can't wait. I'm buzzing to get going. Just about to cook a couple of sea bass fillets. And get an early night, it's been a long day. Up and down, up and down, round and round and round. Not really found a lot. You know, granted, we didn't finish the interview till probably 9, 9.30, so you missed the best bit of the morning. But yeah, it's been difficult. Glad I dropped on here for the night. <laughs> An absolute beast. Clearly super spawned out, but still a mega, mega carp. And after a very tricky day, not really been able to find much to sort of end the day just before dinner, catching this. <laughs> what a fish. What a mega, mega fish. Yeah, what a common it was, a real mega old one. Deep fish, almost bream-like, just empty basically through spawning. But yeah, a real mega one. I got that slip back, had some dinner, and then got to sleep. Yeah, it just didn't happen through the night. Um, didn't really hear them crashing. Didn't get a lot of sleep myself, to be fair. I very stupidly came with just a summer shroud and no bivy. And yeah, it rained pretty much all through the night. Um, didn't turn the fish on though, if anything it turned them off. And I woke up this morning to a very quiet lake. There's not even any tench rolling. Um, it's getting on for half five now. I really need to get on the road and get back to work. As much as I'd like to stick it out for another hour or two, it's probably not worth it. So I'll go and trickle a little bit of bait in, ready for my next session. But sadly that isn't gonna be now for a couple of weeks, uh, well into August. But I'm looking forward to that one. That's gonna be my first time down here with John doing a little bit of fishing. Hopefully we can get a swim raked and actually have a proper go for these tench. I was first introduced to this lake by a very good friend, John Bailey. Uh, John Bailey is, he's a legend in my eyes. He's, he's an iconic angler, one of the, the old school, who after all these years is still at the forefront of specimen fishing. He's not a carp angler nor would he ever want to be. But I kind of feel the same as him. I don't want to be a carp angler. I just want to be a fisherman that loves fishing. I think this, this particular lake has always been hugely low density. That's the sort of romance of it. That's the glamour of it and the appeal of it in a way that there are so few fish in it. It's nearly always crystal clear. There are so many lakes you can go to where there are far more fish and you know you're going to catch, which is great under most circumstances. I mean, I think it's almost every carp angler's dream to discover, to discover somewhere 
that is completely untrodden. I think probably I had the best of it and the people that I used to fish with had the best of it because if we do go back, let's take a date at random, let's say 1975, the waters that we were going to fish, really people did not know anything about. They were untrodden. There were no swims. Nobody knew if there were carp there. Nobody knew how many carp. Nobody knew what size of carp. And, and that was mind-blowingly exciting. And I think deep down, I think a whole load of carp fishermen want exactly that same experience. They want to be the first. They want to, they want to catch a carp that's never seen a bait before. And I think that's a deep longing. We, we, we might have forgotten about that. We might overlay that desire with other ambitions and other targets. But a lot of the carp, and it's nice because I do run one or two carp fisheries. So I do keep very much in touch, I like to think, with what younger carp fishermen are thinking, what they're wanting. And I'll tell you what, they're always talking about, you know, a mythical creature they've seen under the bridge, or they saw something under those willows that was bigger than they'd ever, ever dreamt of in the lake. So I think within all carp anglers, there is still this desire to explore the unknown and catch the unknown. And I think it's a real basic instinct. And I still get it, you know, I see an old, beautiful, staggeringly exciting mirror that might be nearly as old as me. And it, and I get blown away by it. Just the, the appeal of these big, old fish. It's such a privilege. <laughs> Have we written tent fishing off yet? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we've written. Okay, no. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> I'm going to land it before you get back. <laughs> oh, it's lovely out there. <laughs> One very confused carp. Teamwork! <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. How about that? The tench didn't want to play ball, but the carp did. Glad I was happy. <laughs> Thanks, happy mate. A cup of coffee as well. Incredible. And so old. And I couldn't have done it without you, John. Or, or should we say that the other way around? You couldn't have done it without me. <laughs> Not entirely sure who's... Uh... I, I've never worked harder for a fish. And... <laughs> it's a shared capture. <laughs> a beautiful share, beautiful moment. Mega. It's quite nice to see a fish this age that doesn't have a tail with a chunk of... Uh, taken out by a knotter, actually. Is it so common up it's here? It's so common, yeah. If you pardon the pun, but you know what I mean? It is so common. That's a beautiful tail, isn't it? The light shining through it is mm. absolutely beautiful. Mm. Yeah, that, that really, really... <laughs> that's tickled me pink. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Same again in a few weeks' time? Um, any time. Thanks, any John. Time. That was lovely. This is the Otter Lair. Um, I don't say I have a smile on my face, but it's the realities of quite a wild water like this, especially with the river running directly behind it. I stumbled across this area a few weeks back now. Um, 
Obviously, I'm not as shocked now as when I first saw it, but back then it really did blow me away. Um, got a large, large area here of shell, uh, and another area through there. It's kind of a bit of a spit, um, breaking up the two, two lakes itself. And yeah, there's definitely been one in here this morning. This particular poo is still soaking wet. And it's just full of crayfish bits, and this is all your crayfish shell here, look. Piles of it. Borrow time. It's not fenced. Um, at the moment, there's an abundance of crayfish. That was the change. The lots have still got feed, you know, and then they'll switch, switch on to something else. That something else most likely be in the carp. Not cool. And if it's not the carp, more often than not, it'll be birds or the birds' eggs. You know, there's another fresh crayfish here from either today or yesterday. Still see part of the head. I've just stuck my head around the corner here. And there's a fresh kill of a duck. So they're very much active. I don't know if there's one or two or a whole gang of them. But uh, this is certainly their layer, so to speak. And um, what I have done is I've got some of these trial cams. I'm gonna get them screwed onto the tree early next week. It sends a direct feed back to your phone and lets you know what's happening. But yeah, it's a cruel world. Um, I don't blame the otters, not really anyway. Just another animal trying to survive, like. It's just a bit of a weird feeling, you know. Duck didn't do anything wrong. Crayfish didn't do anything wrong. The otter didn't do anything wrong. It's just that food chain. Everything's got to feed. Everything's got to live. Going this way, boys. As always, work and life in general got crazy and time had just run away from me. Before I knew it, autumn was upon us. The plan for the autumn had been to bait heavily with the squid in just one main area. After all, these fish were seeing little pressure and there was only one other real gentleman occasionally fishing the place. I got down there as often as I could, preparing spots and applying bait into those deeper, siltier zones. Then a real spanner was thrown into the works that I just hadn't seen coming. The landowner had put around a thousand ducks on the lake and held a shooting syndicate over the autumn and winter months, which involved closing the fishing syndicate during this time. I had my heart set on fishing right through those colder months, but it looked like all the prep was going to have to be for nothing, and I couldn't now get back there till the spring. Although I couldn't get back to that specific syndicate for the carp, I did however manage to meet up with John over the winter months, where I'd tell him all the tales once more of the pit and its carp, whilst we waited for a big old pike to pick up one of our ledger dead baits. The perfect way to spend a cold winter waiting for spring to come back round again. Perfect evening, just that lovely sunset. All those small fish showing and then this. Beautiful, what a big beautiful, pike. beautiful fish. What a privilege. Thank what you. a fantastic privilege. Another fantastic day with Mr. Bay. We always do it, don't we? <laughs> oh. That went back sooner than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My first session back down was a lot later than I'd ever planned. I wanted to get down early spring. Um, 
early spring bin, probably late March, early April. It wasn't until last Friday that I finally got down here. And we're now into May. Can you believe it, May? Although saying that, the lake, of course it's changed, you know, having been away for that six month period, but it doesn't appear to have changed too much, you know. When I left um, at the start of autumn, the leaves hadn't really turned. There's a lot of beech trees around. And um, coming back now, it looks kind of similar. Yes, the foliage on the bank started to burst through and the nettles are, are creeping up. But the actual, the, the trees, and when you look at the, the bigger picture, it still looks quite bland. You know, I was expecting to turn up here and see all the pads up again, all the cabbages emerging, and, and that hasn't been the case. Same for the water clarity, I expected it to be tap clear, but clearly there's been a lot of rain in the surrounding area, and what with the river running directly by the lake, the clarity, quite frankly, is dreadful, you know, really, really bad. So it was only last week that I came back for that very first session. As I say, we're now into May. I really couldn't have been happier that first morning waking up. Not only had I got a fish in the sack, it was just the perfect morning at the lake. Big mist rolling everywhere, sun burning up. And yeah, I just sat there with a huge smile on my face, just content to be back. But there was a darker side to the story. And I had seen this at night when I unhooked the fish on the mat. Unzipping the sack again and looking at this incredible mirror, it really was a shame to see the, the fresh otter damage on its tail. What a way to start my time back at this very special lake. Pretty much just come up really to see the place. It's been so long, like six months since I was last here. I didn't expect to catch, but if you haven't got a rod in the water, you'll never know. And in the early hours of the morning, it bust off and this was a culprit. It's such a shame about the what looks like quite recent damage to its tail from an otter. And I've seen plenty of other signs walking around that they look pretty rife at the moment, which worries me no end that I just don't know how much time I've got left. But for now, I'm gonna take it all in. Look at this incredible beast get the coffee on and sit down and plan the up and coming weeks. Now up until this point, of course I was aware of the presence of the otter. I'd seen him a number of times. In fact, some of the fish I'd caught, they had old otter damage on them, but nothing fresh. This was the first time I'd seen a, uh, an incredible carp with, with fresh otter damage. And, in a way, it kind of left a, a bit of a sour taste on the capture, but at the same time, I'm not daft, you know, it's nature. Um, I think there is a balance here. I think they are managing to just about live in harmony, but the lake did seem to have changed. Now, whether that's because more otters turned up in the winter months, maybe there was less people about that allowed them the freedom to, to be on the water more, I don't know, but once we slipped that incredible mirror back, my eyes just became more aware to, to change. That change being everywhere I looked, there was eggshells, you know, they've clearly been rife on the, on the nesting birds, battered them in fact. I found a pike, you know, that was probably just days old, completely eaten, a tench carcass and a number of other carcasses. And just the, the, the feces everywhere, with yes, the bulk of it containing crayfish, but also lots of bones where they've clearly been after the rodents. And as I say, it left a, a kind of dark cloud over everything because I just don't know how long these fish have got in here. Borrow time. It's the first time I've really seen them properly other than on the trial camera we put in. Would I change it if I had the opportunity? Would I put a big fence around it? Well, frankly speaking, it's not possible because of, of the way the, the river diverts and comes through the pit. Um, it would also ruin it. It would ruin the magic of the place, the fact that there's muntjac every morning and badgers and foxes. And it, as I say, it's nature, it's one of those things. And I feel there is a balance at the moment. How long that balance will last, I don't know. The fish was returned probably no later than half five that morning and I really did have the opportunity to, to soak up the beauty of the place. It was a total different morning to the previous evening. As I said, the sun was burning through and 
yeah, I definitely sat there with a big smile on my face drinking that first coffee of the morning. But I didn't have a huge amount of time. I really needed to get on the road and back to work. So I decided to use the last couple of hours of the session, really, and pack everything away and go and do a big lap with nothing other than a very long landing net pole with a rake on the end and plenty of bait. Because those fish hadn't been fed by me for six months and I really knew now that I didn't have a huge amount of time left of this sort of campaign, if you can call it that. It's been more a, a disjointed series of broken sessions, but I needed to get back on it. I needed to get the bait in. I needed to get those fish revisiting those spots, reprime the spots, clean the spots, ready for the final big push, which is likely to be just two or three more weeks. I lapped the lake a couple of times, and yes, things had changed. Trees had gone in, full-blown trees over areas. There was lots of branches that had fallen off in the winter storms. And I set to clearing areas, not just in the water, but also in the bank, so I could make sure I wasn't cracking sticks and branches as I was approaching different areas of the lake. And yeah, really enjoyed myself. Felt at one with the lake again, got a little bit of bait in, and left it in peace, ready to return the following week. Arriving back here on Monday evening, yeah, I couldn't be happier. This time I didn't just have an overnight session, I had two full nights planned. And having put that bait in just a few days previously, I was full of confidence. Upon arriving the venue, I checked out this smaller pool first. And yeah, couldn't have been happier when the very first piece of water I looked at, a really shallow area in fact, of just a couple of feet deep, over very, very deep silt, I stumbled across three carp puffing away, I crept in quietly, and they were clearly very content feeding on the bloodworm. I left the fish be, walked back to my barrow with a huge smile, just thinking, yes, they're active, they're moving, they're not just in the deeper side, they're actually utilising all the water now. And yeah, it left me really, really full of anticipation of what the night ahead might bring. But I had arrived very late, so after doing another entire lap of the lake, I had to make a call on where I was going to fish. The water clarity hadn't improved, in fact it had got worse. Clearly the river had burst its banks at some point over just the two or three nights I'd been away. And yeah, it was really coloured and making it very, very difficult to find any other signs of activity. I sat up until the early hours and never saw a show, which when I think back to sort of the summer and autumn periods on here, it was fantastic, you'd see them rolling and crashing. Yeah, it was generally just very, very quiet. I decided to fish the deeper area of the water just because that was my gut instinct. The wind was trickling in there. And more than anything, where I set the hide up, it allowed me a real good vantage point looking across the lake. Disappointingly, I woke up that morning with absolutely nothing to go on still. The only fish I'd really seen showing, bizarrely, were some pike that were kind of rolling. There was no tench rolling, no bream rolling, and I hadn't even seen any carp crash in. And I did sit there kind of scratching my head a little bit of what to do next. But the area I decided to fish, it had good form for a kind of mid-morning bite, that sort of nine till 11 o'clock period. So I decided the best thing I could do now with the water clarity being so poor would be to ride it out till at least bite time, maybe midday, and then make a decision what to do for the rest of the day. At about nine o'clock I had the first take. I kind of knew from the, the indications on the receiver that did it, did did did. did. It was gonna be a bream. But to be fair, the bream that I've caught from here in the past, they've never disappointed me, and this one was no exception. A proper classic old bream, bronze with a kind of two-tone to it. And yeah, as much as I'm not here to catch those bream, it did put a bit of a smile on my face. And again, it's a bit of a cliche saying, at least I knew the areas were clean and the rigs were presented well. I shipped the rig back out with a baiting pole, sat well back, and just an hour or so later, this time it proper burst into life and I was into a real decent carp. After such little activity through the night and such little activity at that kind of perfect dawn morning, to then go and get a bite and have an incredible carp, in fact it was definitely the best ruck I've had so far since fish deer. For it to be a recapture, it was a little bit disappointing and it really kind of started making me think what is in here? How many fish are there? How many are potentially left? I also started to really notice the water line on the trees. In the six months that I've been gone, clearly the lake's been flooded for prolonged periods of time, which can mean the fish can now pass in and out. Had a load of fish disappeared? Had some new fish arrived? Had some fish been otted? And yeah, I sat there for the rest of the sort of mid-morning into the early afternoon, really questioning things. 
back in the summer, I was sort of conscious that there might be between 15 and possibly as many as 50 carp. But now I really didn't know. The only way of truly finding out was to fish it hard. And that's my plan now for, as I say, the last three or four weeks. After that, sadly, I'm gonna have to pull off just because of obligations outside of this. I don't want to, I could quite happily fish here for, for years, I'm sure, because of the peace, the tranquility, and just everything about the place that I love so much. But yeah, I am on borrow time. I need to really up the ante now. I need to get back at least once or twice a week. In fact, so much so that I'm gonna try and squeeze three nights in next week, put the graft in, get the bait in, keep on my toes. I still believe in the bottom of my heart there's something really special to be caught from here. There's only one way of finding that out, and that's for me to go and make it happen. It's actually beginning to feel a little bit more like summer. Arriving here this afternoon, there was a lot more green in the trees. Uh, the water clarity is slowly starting to come back. And yeah, even though we're getting uh, some pretty horrible cold winds still and lots of rain, it is now the middle of May and it can't be long before, you know, these fish really start properly getting in the edge. That wasn't today. I have been round six, seven, maybe eight times, round and round, checking, looking. And although I've seen the odd fish, uh, I've had no opportunities in the edge over bait and no opportunities on bread. So yeah, really difficult day to be fair. But I'm in a new swim tonight, uh, an area I haven't really fished. I'm actually fishing out into the lake. I heavily prepped it last time, did a lot of work with the bare lead on the braid, identified a real deep trough, got some bait down there, and I'm going into the night really optimistic and confident. If nothing else, as I say, it's a new swim, new views, and yeah, I can't wait to wake up in the morning and see what tomorrow brings. Definitely went to sleep last night. Big sunset, bit of warmth in the air, mosquitoes, thinking, yeah, we turned a corner with the weather. Sort of summer's on its way. And this morning it was lush, don't get me wrong, like big misty morning again, the sun was burning through. But the rest of the day, it's been freezing cold again, drizzly rain, very windy, and the wind's been all over the place, bouncing around the lake. Um, yeah, I've seen nothing, I tell a lie. I heard a couple of shows sort of just on dusk last night. Uh, other than that, just really quiet, no liners, uh, no shows this morning, no fizzing. And I reeled in mid-morning after a bite to eat, had a big walk around. In fact, I've had two or three walk arounds. I've seen nothing, really got nothing to go on. Uh, I've got tonight, I even contemplated, you know, knocking on the head and, and going home. So little is there to see. Um, but I am going to stick it out, I'll do another night. Whether I stay in this room, I don't know. I've really got nothing to go on. You, know, you, you can stand at various points around the lake and they all look fantastic, but I'm seeing no fish. Yeah, and other than tonight, I'm probably going to get back one more time uh, and that'll be sort of the year up. I've got so many other things on the go, I really can't spend any more time coming up here, which you know, is a shame. I'd hoped this session and the previous one, to be fair, Conditions would have been better. The lake would have burst into life a little bit more. Who knows if there's a big one in here. I certainly haven't seen anything, you know, this time around this spring. Uh, kind of keep seeing the same sort of dozen fish, if I'm honest. But it's a decent enough piece of water. There's plenty of cover, loads of snags, you know, acres of it just covered in cabbages and lilies. There could be a real special one out there. And that's what's keeping me here tonight. Tonight could be the night.
bike was certainly hard to come by on this session, so I was pretty chuffed when just a couple of hours ago, I did get a bike. Sadly, it's a repeat capture, and I've not just had this once before, this is actually the third time now. Uh, it kind of cements in my mind a little bit more just how low stock the venue is. Keep seeing the same fish, starting to now catch the same fish. Um, I'm kind of, in a weird way, glad that my sort of year's coming to an end now, so I don't really want to keep catching the same ones. But yeah, last session for me, next one. If I can get one or two more bites, I'll be very, very happy and leave the place with a huge smile on my face. I've come round into the sort of shallow area of the lake. Um, it's where I've seen the most of the fish this afternoon. Um, lots of fresh silkweed coming up and they seem to be just grazing over the top of that. So I've deposited three choddies. Uh, two went out really perfectly. The third one, I actually had to recast it a couple of times just because I was so surprised how much of a deep drop I got. Anyway, I have left it there. So yeah, I feel like I'm fishing. Um, it's been very hot today. Very, very hot in fact. Um, I reckon if we didn't have this chop on the water, they might have even spawned. So fingers crossed they don't go tonight. We can get one last bite out of here. Even after a year, every time I come back to this place, I still get that same feeling. Driving along the little lanes, butterflies, anticipation, excitement. I just love it here. I absolutely love it here. And yet again, I've turned up and it looks completely different. Even though I was here sort of in July last year, I don't remember any of these flowers like this. The lake itself looks different. The bar's covered in lilies. Uh, the water clarity is really good. Yeah, it just feels great to be here. It's, it's a slice of paradise, no doubt about it. Obviously, the last time I came, what are we talking now? About a month back. That was going to be my last session, and it's quite rare for me, but I had three nights, three days to really get my teeth stuck into the final part of the chapter. Um, and sort of just a few hours in, the fish spawned, which kind of come as a bit of a shock, but, you know, it, it can happen at any point. So... Rod's reeled in, left him in peace. And then classic life gets the better of me, the stresses of work and, and family life. I just couldn't find the opportunity to get back down until now. And this really is, is gonna be the end of it. Um, I can almost say hand on heart that after tonight and a, and a bit of tomorrow morning, I most probably will never step foot back here again. Um, so there's a lot of emotions going through, through me at the moment. Um, lots of great memories already and if I could have one wish it would be yes to bump into that massive fish that I believe I, I saw and lost back in sort of spring last year. That's probably unlikely to happen because I've done my time here now, I've looked and searched and I've never bumped into that fish again. Has it disappeared? Was it ever even in here? I don't know. Um, so for tonight and tomorrow, a nice big tench, that would make me smile a lot, another big bream and just one more special carp would be enough for me to walk away tomorrow with my head held high with lots of lovely memories of this amazing place.
it really is the end. My final night, two bites this morning, and yeah, another repeat capture, which kind of really solidifies the reason for leaving. Low stock, work my way through, at least a good chunk of them. I really hope there is a mythical beast in there, and over the next decade, or even decades, people return to this incredible venue and have their own adventures here. But for me, it's time to leave with really fond memories. It was never about catching loads of big fish, or catching every time I came, or creating a wonder rig, or testing bait. It was just about coming fishing somewhere really beautiful and peaceful, doing my own thing, and most importantly, enjoying it. So, thank you, old mirror. It's been a pleasure to meet you on the different occasions we've bumped into each other. Um, I've got one of your friends in a sack, a nice common. I'm gonna get this one back, get the common out, pack down, gaze out over the water one more time, and then push that barrel across the stream and bid the place farewell. one so powerful huge fins yeah crazy battle from better lilies to better lilies the perfect perfect wake up call literally never get tired of catching carp like this lovely fish to end on classic black common thank you mega so why has it all come to an end? Well, I think more than anything, I want to leave that air of mystery about the place. I've definitely seen at least one, possibly two different fish, both of which I hooked and lost, that I really would have loved to have caught. But I think the repeat captures, that was enough for me. It, it, the fact that I've seen so many of the same fish. But I walk away very, very happy with my time here. And most importantly, with an air of mystery, I'll never forget those moments, losing those fish, watching them take the bait. And yeah, I could come again next season and the season after and possibly catch those fish or something even more impressive. But then I really would have completed it and I'm gonna walk away very, very happy with my time here. Of course, a mega carp. You know, they're in, burnt into my brain and they're just gonna be memories now. And I think that's quite nice to, to not fully complete it, to not be able to tick off every single one in there. If for no other reason, maybe one day I will come back.